Hi, I'm Jim with UltrasoundBoardReview.com. Today, I'm going to teach you how to identify, locate, and report critical findings in echocardiography. Let's say you're in your department and an echo is ordered as a routine study with indications of heart failure. You take the order, you go to the patient's room, you get them all hooked up, and then you place your transducer on the patient's chest to begin the personal long axis view, and you see this. You can tell that there's something in the left ventricle. You can tell that there's structures in the left ventricle that shouldn't be there. Is there an artifact? What's the first step? You just started your exam. Do you run out of the room and go call a doctor? Or do you start measuring the left ventricle and the minor axis? So the first step is to break protocol. So in this case, you're going to move to different views to see if the structures in the left ventricle will go away or not. If it's an artifact, chances are it won't be there in other views. So here we're going to go from the personal long axis view to the short axis view, and then we're going to go to the apical four chamber view. So what are these structures? Are they tumors? Is it thrombi? It looks like those structures are still there. This tells me that whatever this is, is not an artifact. There are three types of thrombi that can be identified in the left ventricle. The first is a mural thrombus. This type of thrombus only exposes one surface. This thrombus is typically flat and parallel to the endocardial border. The second is a protruding thrombus. This type of thrombus exposes more than one surface. This thrombus usually protrudes into the left ventricle, hence its name. The third type is called a mobile thrombus, which is probably the most dangerous. This type of thrombus will move independently as the heart is contracting. These type of thrombi are at high risk of embolizing. Now when you're trying to decipher between whether this is a thrombus or a heavy trabeculated left ventricle, aside from using Definity or any other blood enhancing agent, just look at how the thrombus compares in echogenicity to the rest of the ventricular myocardium. A thrombus will have somewhat of a gel-like, hyperechoic, homogeneous with the regular margins. The characteristics of the structures in this left ventricle tells me that it's multiple thrombi. Realizing that the patient isn't on any blood thinners kind of prompts me to expedite a stat read on this echo. Gently put the transducer down, lower the patient down to ground level, unhook them, and politely say, I'm going to step out for a second, I'll be right back. You don't want to set off any alarms and get the patient panicking. What you don't want to do is drag your feet. The quicker you get information to the reading physician, the quicker that your patient will receive the treatment they need. There are certain situations in echocardiography and certain echo signs that should send off red flags to think there might be a thrombus. These include severely decreased systolic dysfunction, an akinetic apex, an aneurysmal apex, or a pseudoaneurysm. A thrombus will tend to grow or accumulate in areas where blood tends to slow down. If a thrombus isn't treated quickly and efficiently, the chances of embolization are greater. So a thrombus can either embolize to the brain and cause a stroke, or it can embolize to the upper extremities or the lower extremities. If it's on the right side, it can embolize and go to the lungs, causing a pulmonary embolism that can lead to cardiac arrest. Now, let's say that you start an echo, nothing's jumping out at you, and yet you have a globally reduced systolic dysfunction, and you don't see anything. You go through the protocol, still nothing. What do you do? What's the answer? The answer is always use something that will enhance the blood so that you are 100% sure that nothing is growing on the inside of the left ventricular walls. If they don't have an IV, put an IV in. Go the extra mile to help your patients so that they receive the utmost care they deserve. If you want to get good at finding critical findings, be familiar with what's normal. The more normal you know, the more abnormal you will pick up. You probably won't start to notice critical or abnormal findings until you do a few hundred normal echoes. Now, let's take a look at another echocardiogram. Uh, right away, you can tell that the systolic function is reduced, maybe 20-25% EF. I'm going to pause right here. Did anything jump out at you? If it didn't, if nothing jumped out at you, pause, scroll back, and resume. Nothing abnormal in the short axis view.
Now, as we get to the apical four chamber view, do you see anything? Does anything catch your eye? Looks like the chambers are all dilated. Looks like the right ventricular systolic function is also reduced. Let me show you some images with definity. Okay. Looks like we got something here. Sure enough, this patient was reported to have multiple thrombi in the apex of their heart. And the patient was then put on blood thinners. If you're doing an echo and you can't prove without 100% assurity that there is no thrombus, just go grab something that will help enhance the red blood cells so that you can see whether or not there is something growing in there. When the apex is out, definity out. That should be your motto, unless you use Optison. So if you can't see the apex, you have to use something that will show the endocardium. In this next echo I'm about to show you, this was ordered as a routine for a post-myocardial infarction. They received three stents in which they were sent back to their room. So here in the personal long axis view, looks like the EF is down, as expected, coming from the cath lab with three stents. Does anything jump out at you? I'm going to pause right here and just run a Sine loop on this. What do you think? Anything jumping out at you? Okay, I'm going to go to the apical five chamber view. Do you see anything in the ascending aorta? Looks like there's plaque buildup. It looks like with each systolic contraction, they tend to move. Is this something critical? So this patient was asked if they were having any chest pain. And the patient said that they were having pain right here. So as a sonographer, what do we do in this situation? Do we continue on with the protocol? Or do we kind of stop and give more images of the aorta? Well, the protocol was broken and multiple images were taken of the ascending aorta, in which then the sonographer realized that this isn't normal and that there could be a possible type A dissection. So the sonographer put the transistor down, lowered the patient and politely said that they would be right back, stepped out in the hall, called the reading physician, were requesting that they look at this echo sooner than later. After that was reported, the sonographer then went back and started and finished the protocol. Later on, the patient was then taken down to CT in which then a type A dissection was confirmed and they were taken to the OR in an attempt to fix the dissection. So these steps were the correct way in reporting a critical finding. The sonographer knew and had enough experience to know that something was abnormal. They had scanned thousands of normals and knew that the aorta should not look like that. And with their experience, they did everything they could in their power to report the finding as quickly as possible so that they could get the ball rolling in order to save the patient's life. In this next echo, this is a patient who came into the emergency room complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath. So right off the bat, you can tell something's abnormal. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you see an echo like this? If the heart is swinging like that, you should automatically think tamponade. The first thing you should do is go to the apical forward chamber view and run Doppler through the tricuspid and the mitral valves. Use pulse wave and continuous wave. You're looking for a greater than 25% variation in the tricuspid and the mitral valve during inspiration and expiration. Check to see if the right atrium is collapsing after atrial systole, which is the same time period as ventricular diastole. That's one of the first echocardiographic signs of tamponade. Now, go to the subcostal view, check the inferior vena cava. The IVC will usually be dilated and non-compressible during tamponade. Remember, tamponade can only be diagnosed clinically, in which we use the Bex triad. The Bex triad includes hypotension, quiet heart, and distended jugular veins. If the patient has all three, we use echocardiography to back up the clinical signs of tamponade. So echocardiography basically confirms tamponade is occurring. But remember, for your boards, you have to remember Beck's triad. Quiet heart means that when you're being auscultated with the stethoscope, you kind of hear muffled sounds. As you can see in this ultrasound, the heart is surrounded by all this fluid, and trying to listen for sounds in the heart is going to be nearly impossible. The reason why you get muffled sounds is because the heart is completely surrounded by all this fluid. And then thirdly, a distended jugular vein is when your internal jugular vein here will kind of protrude out, just like in this picture here. Another thing you have to remember is that tamponade will cause pulseless paradoxes. This means there will be a greater than 10% decrease in arterial systolic blood pressure. So what is tamponade? 
Tamponade is the rapid accumulation of fluid in the pericardial sac. This is the area between the surus visceral pericardium, aka the epicardium, and the surus parietal pericardium. The pressures will increase so rapidly that the intrapericardial pressures will increase or exceed normal right ventricular diastolic pressures. Now, let's say that you have an outpatient coming in for routine echo, and let's say the indications say murmur. You get the patient all hooked up and you find this. Again, this is an outpatient. What do you see? Is this an artifact? So it looks like they have quite a bit of MR. Now this would be a good time to ask the patient some questions. I realize that if you start asking questions in the middle of the exam or even after you've started, it's going to raise alarms with a lot of patients. You want to start out the conversation with, there were some questions I was supposed to ask before we started. Have you had a fever lately? Have you had chills lately? If they say yes, that might prove, aside from a lab test, because you'll need that later, that this might be a vegetation. So now, what do you do? Do you just send the patient home and say, the doctor will read it and we'll get back to you in a few days? No, you don't let the patient go. You go call the reading physician and you tell them that you have an outpatient here and you ask them if they will read this echo before this outpatient goes home. So in this case, this patient didn't go home. The reading physician called the thoracic surgeon. The thoracic surgeon recommended that they do surgery. So that patient had heart surgery the same day they came in just for a regular routine echo. They just thought they were getting an echocardiogram and they ended up getting heart surgery. But it saved their life. It saved their life because the sonographer had enough experience to know that someone should be contacted. All the right pieces were put into place and the patient was taken into surgery to fix that mitral valve. If you're a student and you're scanning a patient just like this and you see something like this flapping in the wind, just ask questions. Even if you're a second year, third year, fourth year student, even if you feel like you're the best student to have ever walked this planet. If you see something like this, go have someone look at it so that someone with more experience can make a decision to see what the next step is. Remember, our first priority is for the patient's safety, not how good we are. I'm Jim with UltrasoundBoardOfView.com. Stay tuned for part two of our three-part series of critical findings. Thanks for watching.